Thank you so much, Brian. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jenny Bloom, and I'm a professor here at Florida Atlantic University, and I'm also the founder of the Office of Appreciative Education, and I'm delighted to kick off this year's uh, Office of Appreciative Education webinar series with what I know will be an outstanding presentation by my colleague here at FAU, who is Joe Murray. He's the Associate Dean for University Advising Services. And, but more importantly, I'm also really delighted because Joe has been a really important member of our appreciative advising, appreciative education team for a very long time now. I think one of the things that distinguishes appreciative advising is that it's really been a grassroots movement. And I'll tell you that Joe was an important part of that early grassroots movement. And it all goes back to 2007. I was at the Nakata Annual Conference and, and it was in Baltimore. And Joe came up to me after I had presented and said, hey, I'm interested in becoming involved with appreciative advising. And uh, I said, oh, great. I'm on my way to lunch with some folks. And do you want to come along with? And so he got to meet my co-authors, Bryant and Jane, and uh, I'm happy to say that ever since that moment, Joe has been a crucial member of our team. And literally, I wouldn't be here at Florida Atlantic University if Joe had not come here about a year before I came and encouraged me to, uh, to apply for a faculty position that I had seen in the Chronicle of Higher Education. And it's been really great because Joe and his wife, Karen, and his two children have uh, become part of our F Florida family. And uh, I am forever indebted to Joe for all that he has contributed to appreciative advising and appreciative administration, but also I'm just grateful for his friendship. So with that, I am truly honored to present to you Joe Murray. Joe? Thank you, Jenny. Uh, much appreciated. Always, always fun to, to be a part of this. And and for all the folks on the call here, be careful when you say you want to get involved because you never know where that road is going to lead you. So, so here we are. So let me um actually I'm as is probably all of us these days. I'm navigating three screens. So let me get all my screens where I want them, and we'll get sharing. All right. Here, okay. I uh, will uh, rely. Okay, so it looks like we're good to go. Uh, a couple of, of, I guess, notes here before we get rolling. Given uh, the size of this, what we're going to ask folks to do is to put any, any questions or things that come up as we go through this into the chat. And then uh, if I can, in the flow of the, the webinar, I will certainly address those. But our team here behind the scenes are going to be sort of recording all of those. And then in our Q&A, we're going to go back and address and answer any of those that we may not have have done. So if, if you can uh, stay muted, I'm, I'm I, with so many folks on here. I'm not uh, I'm not able to track any, any hand raises. So put those into the chat if if you don't mind. Um, so let me uh, let's see here. Let me make sure we can do our our clicks. All right. So uh, as as Jenny said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I think there's a couple of of relevant uh, pieces of information I'd like to add to, to her her very uh, welcoming introduction for myself. Uh, as she said, Associate Dean here at, at uh, Florida Atlantic University. I uh, have been involved with uh, the, the Appreciative Advising Movement uh, and one of, of Jenny's national trainers for many, many years. Uh, also been very active in NACADA. Uh, for those of you who, who are maybe new to this, uh, that stands for the National Academic Advising Association, which is one of our professional organizations, uh, and in particular, working with our first generation uh, interest group uh, for NACADA uh, during those years there. Uh, also, one of my uh, professional passions is, uh, if you will, is working with and supporting foster youth and homeless students. 
and have um, had the pleasure uh, and the privilege of starting several organizations to support them. Would love to have a conversation with anybody offline about what you can be doing to help support uh, those populations. I guarantee that every single person on this, on this call or on this uh, webinar has those students on your campus, no matter how selective uh, your institutions are. Uh, so I would urge you to, to pay attention to them. Uh, and of course, then working with uh, schools all over the country on student success retention uh, as, a, as a consultant. Okay, um, I think it's important for you to know a little bit of context in terms of where and what I do uh, as we get into this a little bit. Uh, so here at Florida Atlantic University, uh, you can see the, the six campuses, uh, around 30,000 students, and I oversee uh, the freshman and sophomore, first and second year uh, students as they come through the onboarding uh, and uh, the declaration of major and all those types of things. So we'll, uh, uh, we'll get into that here in the next slide. I would like to share with you all actually some, some really good news for us as an institution that literally hit today. Uh, we've, um, we've been working and focusing on our national rankings for some time and U.S. News and World Report uh, just moved us up, I don't know, about 50 some slots to number 112 uh, in the country, which was uh, really big for us. And maybe even more importantly than that uh, is that we're ranked now number 26 in the nation for something called social mobility. And for those of you who are not familiar with that term, uh, it has to do with the social economic class that a student comes in sort of being a part of and how they are able to, if you will, move up uh, that social mobility as they as they graduate and move into their career. So that's, that's a, uh, one that we're very, very proud of. Uh, overall, uh, what, do I, what do I oversee here? And I think this is important because we're going to be talking about some examples in these areas, but I also want to make it very clear uh, that, that what we're going to talk about can be applied to a huge range of different offices and areas in, in higher ed and actually uh, beyond. Uh, but for me personally, as I mentioned before, working with our first and second year students, uh, all undecided students are under my umbrella. Uh, the model here for academic advising is they would start with us uh, in university advising services. And then as students declare their major and complete their gen eds right around uh, the end of their sophomore year, they're transitioned into their college of their major, most of which have professional advisors. And so that handoff occurs at that point. Uh, also under my umbrella, which you'll, you'll see a little bit of this, is our university honors program advising, uh, the software that we use uh, to, to help uh, track and do intervention with students, uh, our success networks, which we'll talk about, and then a lot of special populations, our summer pathway programs, uh, the academic success, uh, the FAU, or I'm sorry, the um, dual enrolled in high school students, change of major processes, uh, pre-law, pre-med, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and then all the full-time and part-time students obviously a part of this as well. So that gives, gives you kind of a quick uh, overview of some of the things that we're responsible for. Okay, we're going to look at um, actually two main topics today. Uh, the science of caseload management, uh, and there is indeed a science, and I think uh, part of this hopefully will be uh, some new things that you haven't thought about from this perspective. And then there's also uh, the art of caseload management. Uh, and if it's not evident in the language that I'm using right now, we'll, we'll define that uh, as we get going. Uh, so those are going to be the two main areas. Uh, I am also one of those folks when I was little that if I could find my birthday presents ahead of time, it was inevitable that I would peak. And so I'm going to honor that, uh, <laughs> that, that personal, personality trait of mine. And I'm going to start with a data slide here so that you know where we're headed. Oop, and of course, I hit the button too quick. There we go. All right. So I want to start with this, and we will revisit this, but I think this is absolutely critical that we start with the fact that what we're going to talk about works. And I'm going to say that again. What we're going to talk about today works. Um, I came here uh, actually about 10 years ago, uh, week, last week uh, was my 10-year anniversary. And when I came, uh, FAU was a did not have an academic advising model. We did do obviously course scheduling and they used that as the model, but there really wasn't a model. It was a walk-in academic advising and course scheduling uh, among other things. And you can kind of see where we've gone over the last 10 years. You're looking at two, two lines here, the 
blue line, the one on the bottom, uh, which is this is a state measurement, which is why it's on here. The state of Florida measures students re student retention, but only those students that come back who are above a 2.0. So that's what that the blue line represents is the progress rate. The red line is probably more uh, more familiar to, mo to most institutions, and that is simply measuring the number of students that return for their second year, so their first year to second year retention rates. Uh, and as you can see, we've gone from uh, the mid uh, 66, 65% ranges all the way up to the, the mid 80s. Uh, and we'll be at the highest rate in our institutional uh, history uh, this fall at 84%. So we are really, really proud of that. Uh, as you can imagine, this also is going to reflect in our four-year graduation rates. I will save that one to the end, but I thought it was really important to kind of show you that this stuff does work and has an impact before we jump into the, uh, the, the nuts and bolts of this. Okay, so let's talk about the science of this. So let, let, me, let me back up here for just a second. So academic advising for a lot of institutions is defined as simply course scheduling. And in fact, that is absolutely critical. If you're not, if you're not advising students into the right courses for the right majors, uh, we might as well end it now because that is absolutely critical. However, it is also very clear uh, from, from every piece of data that you can find out there that simply getting students into the right courses based on their declared major is not enough. That is not going to move your needle uh, and not move those graphs that I just shared with you. And so you've got to take this a step further. And that's what we were faced with 10 years ago when I came here was that what is the model we're going to use and how are we going to leverage that out? Uh, so what occurred then is a couple of things. And I want to be very careful here because certainly case management is a very important piece of this, of this story, but it's not the only piece. So a couple of things that happened uh, over the course of these 10 years. We shifted from defining and advising as course scheduling to relationship building. And at no surprise, we've used the model appreciative advising, but at the end of the day, it's about building a relationship with your students, because if you don't have that relationship, they are not gonna tell you when they're hitting those roadblocks and are thinking about stopping out, dropping out or transferring, right? So that relationship building is absolutely critical. The technology is also really important. No matter what you use, you need to be thinking about the types of technology that will allow you to take advising notes that you can do outreach and document that outreach uh, through email. Text certainly is, is uh, I think, also now growing in importance. Uh, and predictive analytics, which is, I think, sort of a, a newcomer here, but, but certainly has its role as a part of this. Um, so what you're looking at right now is the advising loads, if you will. And so obviously data is gonna be critical. And I mentioned earlier uh, my background. So I am a Purdue grad and actually an engineering uh, undergraduate. And so I think through these, these data lenses and what I'm gonna share with you in terms of these models that I developed, as far as I know, and through all of my, my travels and conferences and consulting, uh, I'm the only one that I've come across that has been able to build mathematical models to forecast and to uh, to model these types of things. So, so that's going to be something I'm going to share with you today. So I'm using the 2019 data here because this was the last fall semester before COVID really changed everything. And, and at least for us, fortunately, we're kind of going back to those pre-COVID days in terms of the number of students coming back into our offices, uh, connecting with us. And so this is sort of our benchmark. What you're looking at here is the advising loads for my office for each week of the fall semester. Okay, the blue line are the appointments that came in. Uh, the orange are the ones that canceled and you can cancel up to an hour before the meeting. Uh, so sometimes we could get those rescheduled. Most of the times we could not. And then of course the no-shows uh, were appointments that obviously were not refilled because the student didn't show up uh, at, the, at the time. Um, so you can see, and if you, for those of you who are in advising, you, you can guess <laughs> what, what time of the year it is uh, for these, these lines that stick up here at the 1,000 and 1,200. Those are 1,200 students per week for that week. And as you can imagine, that is not academic advising. That is pure course scheduling as fast as we can possibly do it. 
Uh, now, related to this, uh, it's, you're probably going to want to know. So our advising ratios when I first started here were in the 800 to 1,000 per advisor ratio. Uh, and that's probably not a big surprise if you're simply doing course scheduling. But when we shifted our model to the, the appreciative advising model and build in relationships, you, you can't do that with those types of numbers. And so we worked really hard to, and actually the model that I'm going to show you next on the next screen is what we used to convince our leadership that we had to hire more advisors. And in fact, we did. We hired 20 additional advisors across the FAU system in order for us to do this. And the data and the, what I'm gonna show you is, is what convinced them of that process. Okay, uh, let's see, I think, let me take a quick look here. Um, academic advising is required and mandatory for students who are onboarding. So your very first semester, uh, but we do that electronically. We do not require a student to come to campus because we have so many uh, out of state students, international students, uh, but we also don't want to have them wait to come to orientation to do their course scheduling, because if you don't come until August, as you might imagine, what you have to pick from is very different in August than when you're registering in, in, in June or July. Um, so we do that electronically. So, so we can talk more about that if we have time here at the end. Uh, and we do case management, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what that means here in, in a minute. Uh, let's see. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to the next next screen here all right so the question becomes and i'm going to ask you all a, a a question and you can you can pop this into the into the chat how many of you have ever been told by your your leadership your supervisors or on up the the chain of command to stop doing something versus always one more program one more group of students one more uh one more intervention Right. In my 30 some years in higher ed, I have never had any supervisor un, uh, not unprovoked, but uh, on their own come to me and say, we no longer want you to do this. It's always one more. And I'm going to ask you right now, what is the single most important resource that every one of you has? I want to see this in the chat. What is your most important resource above all else? Ah, we've got some smart people in here. Beautiful time. Absolutely. Time. You cannot create more time. You can work 24-7, 365, but you will at some point run out of time. And that is the piece that is absolutely critical in, in terms of leveraging and sharing that narrative of what your staffs are doing. So, so let me also pause here because I know we have a very diverse audience here and this is not just about academic advising. Yes, that's the, 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 um, the example I'm gonna use, but I have worked with and we have seen this used in just about every type of office on campus. If you can measure who your assigned students are, then this will work, okay? So whether it's TRIO or coaching, uh, career services, uh, tutoring, it does not matter. Uh, you can do this as long as you know who your audience is. Now, I'm going to start with that because that simple statement is very misleading. So the first thing you're looking on, you're looking at on here is that blue box uh, number of the students assigned to the office. Uh, and what actually, what you're looking at here is also not our FAU model. This is a, a sample that I put together for this in terms of the actual data. Um, but it took us a year as an institution to come to an agreement to what was the population of students and how to measure it for my office. And I'm gonna tell you, do not rush this. You need to have complete buy-in and an understanding of who your audience is, because if you don't, then all the rest of this can be too easily dismissed by, well, that your, your student population is not what you told it, it, what you reported it. And here's, you know, we're not going to believe any of these outcomes. So the reason this is so important is when you take the snapshot of who you're responsible for is absolutely critical to your numbers, right? So from an advising example, do I take that snapshot after the drop ad the first week? Do I take that snapshot during the summer? when we are spending time, resources, 
in advising and onboarding students, some of whom are going to melt away and not actually matriculate, right? But I can't ignore that because we've put resources into those students this summer, even though they might melt uh, before classes start in August, right? So that is critical to make sure that you can as exact as possible define who your assigned students are to your office. All right, the next thing on here then is not a head count, but an FTE measurement of who your advisors are. This also is misleading in terms of its simplicity. How do you define academic advising? Who is that? Are they grad students? Are there faculty who do that? Is it a full-time uh, professional role? Is it athletics? Is it coaching, right? Do your advisors have responsibilities on other campuses? Are those students on other campuses uh, included in your count, right? So the number of students assigned, does that include students from Middletown and Hamilton and Oxford, or is it going to be specific to a, a particular campus, right? For, for FAU, R spans all of our campuses. So we don't separate those out, especially after COVID because our, a lot of our advising, uh, at least students have the option of doing it virtual. So it doesn't matter which campus anybody's on at this point, they can set up a, a, a meeting with any of them. Okay, so that, that 15 number is an FTE. So if you have, and say a grad student who works 20 hours a week, then they should be a 0.5. If it's a faculty member who has, let's see, three quarters time teaching responsibilities, you would wanna count them as a 0.25, right? All right, the next number on here comes out of my, actually I have a, a, a human resource uh, background, HR. And so we did a job analysis because none of my advisors only meet with students. They have other responsibilities and most uh, I guess I'm going to use the term regular. We'll put <laughs> air quotes around that. Most typical types of advising offices would be very similar to this. So, so my frontline advisors also serve on committees, both internal to the office and to the institution. They, they participate in, in, in searches, right? They teach maybe an orientation or a you know, university 101 class. So they have other responsibilities. So you can't assume and build your model on an eight to five only meeting with students because you're already now behind the gun. Okay, so we, we base that on about 70% of our frontline advisors, 70% of their time is meeting with students. All right, we also did this for our different layers. So we have a career ladder that came out of this. That's an, another conversation, but I would be happy to share our career ladder with folks. But basically we have advisor level one, two, and three, all of which are at about 70%. Assistant directors, which would be the next level up, uh, are about 50% 50, 50 student, uh, st direct student contact and 50% administrative. Associate directors are about 70-30, 30% is the student. And then at the director level, and then above that executive director and, and my role, Dean, uh, I don't figure into this at all, I get zero. <laughs> the only students that make it to me are the ones that have exhausted all the rest of my staff. Um, so, they're, so they're not included in this at all. Then it becomes actually a, a numbers game, right? So you fit 70% of a 40 hour week work week is your 28 hours. We figure that out for the entire staff. Number of weeks per semester. Uh, I don't know about you, but my staff does not work 365 days a year. They have sick days and vacation and annual leave. And so we did an analysis of that. Uh, and generally speaking, most of my staff, and certainly most of my experiences with most staff, most advisors don't usually take off a lot of time during uh, the semesters in which courses are in uh, in session. And so we based this on a 16-week term. We did not count, uh, calculate summers or the holiday breaks, even though we might be working or spring break, for example. Uh, and most of our advisors only lost about uh uh, five days of work, you know, an hour here or there for a doctor's appointment or something along those lines. Okay. So you get the idea there. Okay. Then we figure this then for the total number of hours for the entire staff. And then we calculated that into minutes. And I'm going to give a shout out here. I, I, I shouted out to, to Solchek here a minute ago, a, uh, a, a friend and colleague of mine up at uh, in, in Middletown. But more importantly than that, for this conversation is an econ uh, background. And I was struggling with the next piece of this. And he is the one that gave me the breakthrough. I don't know if I actually ever told Solchek this, but he gave me the breakthrough to think about this in terms of minutes. 
And the reason this was so important is because at least for my staff, and I suspect for all of your staff, whether they're advisors or not, you don't spend the same amount of time with each student. You might schedule the same amount of time. And in fact, we do, our normal appointments are 30 minutes each, but the actual amount of time we spend is really driven by the student for the most part. And so we were able with our, uh, with our software uh, to calculate not the length of a time we scheduled the appointment for, but the actual length of time we spent with the student. And this was measured by when the student started, when they, when they came in for their appointment, we would literally start the clock ticking. And when they left and we put the notes in, that would stop the clock. And we could do an analysis on that. And what came out of that was about 5% of our student population came in for, for a 15 minute appointment. And you can imagine these are probably the students that are doing well, well academically, good GPA. They've got a declared major. Uh, they've kind of got their all life planned out in front of them. And they just need somebody to do a quick check, maybe answer a couple of questions, and they're good to go. They're out the door. The vast majority of our students are at that 30 minute mark. And that's where you'll see that 50 percent. Then we had uh, about 40 percent of our students was at the 45 minute mark. So these might be maybe a student that uh, maybe is struggling on, on a uh, a course or two or midterms weren't that great or they're undeclared undecided and they want to talk a little bit about their interests and passions and majors right and then the the hot messes the the five percent at the hour these are the ones that boy you just you're 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 doing everything you possibly can to try to get them back on track okay two things come out of this and I, i've spent some time on this because i think it's really important for you to understand the model but the two things I want you to remember out of all of this are the green boxes and the red down here. Total number of minutes is pretty much a fixed number. The only way you're gonna change this is by either changing your FTEs up here with your number of advisors or the percentage of time that they spend with students. And both of those things are really hard to change. The other thing that's gonna be a fixed number is the number of appointments. So that 11,235, which is based on the percentage of the length of time, is also a fixed number. And this is going to be really important when I share the next slide to keep those two things in mind. Okay, so remember 378 and roughly 11,000. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and go to the next one. Okay, so oh wait, let me, let me do one other thing here. Let me, let me back up. This bottom number here, this advisor to student ratio. So this is, for most of our leadership, the talking point that, that anybody who is not in the trenches wants to know, report out to your board of trustees, print in your brochures, is what is your student to advisor ratio or your student to your counselor ratio or your career person or, or uh, trio or whatever that is, right? But unfortunately, that's all it is. It's a talking point. And I'm going to explain why that is in a second, but that's a fixed number because that's based on the two things that we just talked about, minutes and appointments, which is also fixed. All right, so now let's go ahead and go to the next screen. Okay. As a director, as somebody who is in the trenches, making sure that I have enough appointments for our students, no matter what office I'm in, the ratios are relevant. What is important then is the number of minutes that I have to spend and the number of appointments that I have available. And those things have to be in alignment. I can have plenty of minutes, but if all those appointments are 15 minutes and I'm taking an hour, <laughs> I'm in trouble, right? And so both of those things have to be in alignment. So the model I'm showing you here, and this is generic because again, we share this with institutions that I work with to build this for what works for you. So for example, let's say student number one here, is our honor student that I talked about that only needs a 15 minute uh, appointment. So they're coming in once a semester, 15 minutes. We actually do a calculation and we figure out how many students meet that profile at our institution. We build into it that 20% of them, and this is coming from our, our um, advising uh, database, about 20% of this population will come in a second time on their own. And so we, we don't limit them. Sorry, you know, you came in once, we can't see you again. Of course not, right? So we build that into the model though. You got to think about these things. Okay, so what happens then is we start to subtract off the amount of minutes that I'm spending with this group and the number of appointments I've spent. So if you extrapolate this out, it's very quick. You can tell very quickly that all the different types of student profiles that you have, 
are going to take a different amount of minutes and a different amount of appointments. And if you get to the point where you have run out of minutes or you've run out of appointments, you're in trouble. All right. So student number two here might be our undecided probation student. So they're below a 2.0. They're struggling. So we're going to meet with them five times a semester, 45 minutes each. This is actually our coaching model, which I'll share here in a little bit. Uh, but that's that's what, how much time we're spending with those, right? Uh, student uh, number two, or number three uh, might be our honor student that's undeclared. So we're going to meet with them twice, but they're doing okay with GPA. Uh, they just need a little help deciding, right? All of this in this part of the database, you can change literally overnight. And I'm going to say that again. You can change this overnight. So if you're out of balance... You can say, you know what, we just can't do five meetings uh, a semester with our probation students. So I'm going to drop that to four. Or, you know what, 45 minutes is a luxury we just don't have. We're going to really try hard to get this down to 30. And what happens is, and this is a slide shot, so I can't actually show this live, but you can go into this and you can change this to four. And you can see in real time how many additional minutes you add and how many appointments you add. And so you can adjust this case management, if you will to meet what you're trying to do. And I'm gonna let you think about that for just a second. So this we can literally change. And remember, here's, so all of our students, all of these student types need to add up to your caseload, your 5,000. If it doesn't, you're missing somebody. And we're calculating the total number of minutes we're using and the total number of appointments. Now, Part of this also is I'm going to give you a shortcut. So, so this is obviously very, very powerful. And we this is what we use to get 20 additional advisors. The college came back to us, the university came back and said, okay, we want a roughly a 300 to one advising ratio. But more importantly, here's our, you know, our goals for retention and graduation rates. And we want you to be spending more time with students. And I said, okay, perfect. Here's how we're going to measure that. And here's how many appointments I am short. Uh, and we said, Either you tell us what you want us to stop doing or you give me additional resources. And I'll be happy to stop doing something if that's what you want, but that's your decision and leadership, not mine. And you know what? They didn't want us to stop anything. They wanted to add things on. So that's where the additional funding came from. A quick and dirty assessment of this, something that over 30 years of experience um, I've sort of clued into, is generally speaking, if you have appointments that are posted out there, again, no matter what office we're talking about, if those appointments, if you can stay about two weeks out and you're meeting the demand, you're probably in balance. You're probably doing okay. If you post two weeks out and they're full within an hour and you post another week and it's full within another 20 minutes, you're behind. And I will also tell you, you don't want to schedule appointments in most cases, any further than three weeks. And actually, if you can get away with it, I would do two weeks. Because guess what happens? The further out you schedule appointments, your no-show rates start to go up. And I can't afford to lose appointments because students don't show up. That would absolutely kill us because our, our uh, ratios for staff, I don't have enough flexibility to lose 20% of appointments for no-shows and still be able to meet with all of our students. Because then they schedule another appointment, right? And they come back in. So that is absolutely critical. So yeah, so David, uh, thanks for the, the shout out there as well. Two weeks is really kind of the magic number there. Okay, let me keep going here and then we'll, we can circle back here at the end. I can answer specific questions on this. Okay, so the question now becomes, so there's the science, if you will. We're not quite ready to shift into the art, but we're getting close. If you, actually, you know what? Let me go back. I wanna point out one other thing here. All right, let me go back to this. So one of our goals was we had to figure out a way to get all of these students up here in these, in these long lines. How do we backfill them into where I have the capacity down here? So I oversee a staff of about 35 folks. Um, most are advisors, but there's a few other people mixed into their administrative support and others. But we can handle as an office with doing 30 minute appointments, 550 students per week. And that also builds in uh, somebody who's always on call every single day uh, so we can answer phone calls and address you know, the emergencies that literally walk in, right? 550 is our magic number. So how do I get all of these students up here in the 600, the 800, 1,000 to backfill when I have the capacity to do that? 
All right, so the question then becomes, what do we do? All right, so our magic number is 550. So what we did is we identified groups of students that when you add them up are right around, now not around 550 because you're never gonna be 100%. So we, we averaged about, and actually our goal was 80%. If we could get 80% of a group of students to come in and schedule appointments early, then that was a victory, okay? So for example, so we matched, we mapped out the entire semester and we said, okay, what groups of students do we wanna see each week that we wanna target? That doesn't mean we won't see other students during that time, but this is direct marketing targeting that group of students. Okay, and I'm going to use athletics here as an example. So about two thirds of the way down, uh, we went to our athletic folks and we said, okay, what weeks in the semester is the sweet spot for your folks that they're least likely to be on the road, that they're least likely to be competing, uh, that they, they need the schedules done by because of NCAA or other things. And they came back and said, week seven and eight are our sweet spot. And I said, okay, we're going to reserve week seven and eight for you, but what I want you to do then is you build in to all of your interventions with your coaching staff, the athletic tutoring, the, the um, uh, uh, what do they call those, study tables, you know, all of those interactions, you are going to help us spread the word that, that October, the week of October 5th is when we've set aside for advising, right? And so, boom, we've got other offices now all over campus recruiting for us to make sure their population of students come in on the week that I can handle them. And that way, if I have an athlete who doesn't come in until week 10 and they've missed their window for whatever it is that they needed that schedule by, actually, they've missed their advanced registration window in this case. You know what? <laughs> I did everything we possibly could. We will advise you now, but that is on you, right? So that that is helped. So, just quickly, the groups of students we picked are groups of students that we had leverage on, All right? And so for example, uh, Kelly Struhl and RISE, these are scholarship-based programs that they are a full, ride, a full ride. But we went to them and said, okay, we wanna build into this full ride the, the requirement that they meet with their advisor and that they're gonna meet with their advisor now on weeks five and six. And their, their scholarship is in jeopardy if they don't do that. Now, you all know what required means in higher ed. <laughs> We're not going to pull that. But if I can get 80% of those college school students to come in week five and six, victory. Okay? So I'm not going to go through all of these, but you need to think about your institution and which ones uh, are, are the ones that are going to be the ones you can leverage. Okay. Now, you've got to change student behavior. So here's where we start to get into the marketing. So I bet most of you didn't know, and this is gonna be specific to advising, that there's a national holiday for academic advising. And is indeed Labor Day. And how can I say that? Labor Day stands for let's all begin our registration advising. How about that? And so at orientation, remember where we don't do scheduling or advising at orientation. In fact, the expectation is that that is done before they attend orientation. All I want them to remember in our presentations, we do not spend a whole lot of time talking about the gen eds and, and all of those minutia that they will never remember, right? Data has been clear. Students will remember, I think it's less than 20% of what you tell them at orientation. So I have three messages. One of the messages I want them to remember is Labor Day. And actually we have them pull out the phone and said, program it right now. You're gonna start scheduling your appointments with your advisors on Labor Day. Absolutely critical. Uh, and in fact, we were so good at that, we were actually in a bit of a trouble right now because we are booked three weeks out and we have students screaming for more appointments because they all, <laughs> they all recorded that as Labor Day. But I would much rather have that problem now in September than in December <laughs> before we go away for break. All right. Now we're going to do this second piece here really quickly because uh, we're running out of time, and I want to make sure we have time to, to get to questions, but I think the art of this is equally important, all right, the, uh, the art of this, uh, and this is about our success network. So first of all, one of the things that I, is this is a personal bias on my part, and let's see if I can do this, I'm looking at this, so, so holding up a, a tool here, so anybody know what this is? 
Anybody know what this is? Drop that in the chat. There we go. A reacher grabber. Yeah, the trash show. So actually, I will give you half credit. This is intrusive advising. <laughs> this is intrusive advising. Intrusive advising is not an advising model. It's how you go and grab students and get them to come in to see you. Okay. But once you grab them and get them to come in, then what do you do with them? That's the advising model. Right. And so there's lots of ways to be intrusive. In fact, some of the things we've done is we've put advisors in our parking garages for our commuter students. Uh, we have uh, advisors that during peak times will be in a golf cart and, and go around and answer questions. Um, I've seen other schools uh, that have done uh, rec centers, cafeterias. If you're in an urban area, actually, we worked with Hostos Community College and they were in downtown Bronx. They put advisors on the subways uh, during peak times. All right, so critical there. So what the model is, I already talked about appreciative advising, right? What do you do with them when they come in? This is critical. You can have the best case management, the best intrusive advising that's out there. But if when you bring them in, all you're doing is course scheduling, it's not going to move the needle. It will help, but it's not going to move the needle. All right. So the question becomes, how do we go from, from this? Actually, so, so let me, generational question here. How many folks recognize what this is? Well, though, thank you, Bonnie. I, I, I asked my freshmen now and they have no idea <laughs> what we're talking about. I will also challenge you to say this is also what most of our offices look like the first week of school. Right. The question becomes, how do we go from that to the same packed offices, virtually or in person? Right. But individual, all individual. This is absolutely critical because they could be asking the same question but the motivation for those questions and the right answer to those questions could be vastly different depending on where they're, what they're doing. Uh, and actually, yes, uh, Julia, great, a great point. Depending on the culture of your campus, I do use proactive as opposed to intrusive. It kind of depends on who I'm talking to. Uh, so, so great, uh, great comment there. Absolutely. Okay. So, what have we done? We build a team of people to wrap services around these students. And that's what we call our success network. So building those partnerships, leveraging resources, sharing knowledge, and of course the technical support, okay? So key components. Here's the different wraparound support that we've spent time cultivating. And I'm gonna share with you, so one of the things I want you to keep in mind, this is not built overnight. This is a 10 year journey that I'm sharing with you, okay? So you gotta be in this for the long haul. All right, so when we first started building our success networks, we actually started with case management for advisors. So that was the model I just shared with you. So that was the blue pie there. And our career office came to us and said, you know what, we really like the outcomes that you're, uh, that you're using. Uh, we wanna do case management with you. And, I, and actually to their director, I said, no, you don't. It is a nightmare. You're managing these relationships constantly. All right, so what we ended up doing is saying, assign your career consultant to my advisor and share the same caseload. And that was an aha moment for us because now we're not having to maintain those technical connections more than once, but we're building a team around the same group of students. So we've got an advisor working with the same career consultant sharing that. We've got financial aid that jumped into this and our success coaches for students that are on academic probation. So this was the early model. It has grown into now this. And so we've added into this team, if you will. Uh, and yes, Rose, thank you for that. We, I'm always careful about promoting specific software. Uh, we, we were Starfish, we are Navigate, Advisor Track uh, is another one. There's a lot of good ones out there. Just like buying a car, you wanna pick the one that, that's gonna work for you, right? Okay, so we've added in uh, housing, so if a student doesn't come in and we're, we're there a no-show, we literally communicate that with housing and our RAs go knock on the door. Hey, your academic coach is reaching out. They haven't heard from you. Follow up, right? The other thing that we did is right before COVID, and, and I will not take credit for this. This was dumb luck. I had no idea that the world was going to shut down. But we added a personal librarian to this and we assigned. And so when a student logs into their success network, so this is a electronic page, if you will, not only can a student see a name and an email and a phone number for all these individuals who are assigned to them, 
the case management, but also the personal librarian. And when we shut down and went virtual literally overnight because of COVID, that allowed our students a direct and personal to connection to resources in the library that allowed them to, to get help on how to navigate the virtual library world. And so that was absolutely critical for us. Okay, I'm gonna go through these really quick on this just because these are just examples. And so we do do academic coaching. I've mentioned that a couple of times. You can see kind of the things that they do here. Uh, all of, they meet with them every other week. So it's very intrusive, very hands-on. Does it work? Absolutely. So and we measure success by getting students off of probation, which means above a 2.0. And so students that don't do the coaching have about a 30, eh, maybe let's round it up to 35% average over the last 10 years of getting themselves off of probation. For the ones that actually use all of the resources with our coaching, 70%. Huge, right? And so again, that has been really critical for us. Okay. We do special outreach for our foster youth and our homeless students. So that's the Educate Tomorrow program. We're very careful about the language we use. And again, I'd be happy to have offline conversations with anybody who'd like to talk a little bit about resources for your foster youth and homeless. I will tell you that nationally, they have about a five to 10% graduation rate. Five to 10%. They are the worst group in terms of graduation rates of any group on campuses. If you can move the needle with them, you will immediately see your graduation rates go up. But it's not an easy needle to move. We also do honors. And so we have dedicated advisors for our honors program. We also created a pre-law program here. Delel is actually, as far as I know, for the state of Florida, the only first year advisor who is actually a practicing attorney. She has her law degree uh, and her passion turned out to be not in the courtroom, but working with students. Uh, a personal note here that I'm going to, uh, to share uh, that I can't pass up at this point. So, so my son is an FAU grad. Uh, he decided the start of his junior year, he was interested in law. He was the first student that Delel started working with. Uh, and I will tell you, yesterday, we found out that he passed the bar. <laughs> so mom and dad, as you might imagine, first it was tears and then it was uh, total jubilation. Uh, but it was so critical in terms of this, uh, this support. All right, the success model. So how do you start to build this? So you want to be very intentional about looking at your pathway that students come through. So I'm going to use this just as an example. And again, apply this to all these different offices, TRIO, career, uh, you know, all um, uh, disability services, um, whatever offices that you're working with. Who are your students? And take this from the point of onboarding and work it all the way through. So let's do first gen as an example here. So we've got a first gen student who's admitted. What are they coming in as? So these are the programs that potentially a first gen student could be admitted. We look then at what are their academic standings and then what support do we build around them? And if you have big holes here, that's where you know you need to, to start to spend some time and resources. Undeclared students, another area that spend some time thinking about. Uh, and it can't be a one and done. We actually have a year and a half intervention process built for undeclared students with the goal that they have to have a major by the end of their sophomore year, period. We actually put a hold on their record. If they haven't declared by 45 credit hours earned, then that's it. And, and yes, David, actually, we use the word deciding here too, but I wanted to be clear with everybody. Uh, undecided is, is, I think, a little bit broader, but we actually do use the term deciding students. Uh, we do newsletters and a variety of different things. So, so great, yeah, great comment there. I appreciate that. Whoa. Um, okay. We're wrapping up. So pictures are worth a thousand words. Everything we talked about, I think, boils down to the picture you're looking at here. We have students that come in with a vision that they've either created themselves or their parents or family members or teachers or, or even peers have sort of said, hey, you know, I think you'd be a great fill in the blank, teacher, engineer, uh, social worker, whatever that might be. That's the unicorn, right? It may have absolutely no relevance in terms of the student's interests, passions, or strengths. And so what I want our students and our advisors to be thinking about is to help students understand that, you know what, it's not about being becoming the unicorn. It's about becoming the prize-winning mayor at the Kentucky Derby. It's leveraging your strengths, your passions, and where you want to go 
and we're going to help you get there. Absolutely critical. All right, back to the data, our last sheets here. So you've already seen this. Does this work? Absolutely. But it's not just case management. It's the case management. It's the relationship building, what you do with them when you get them to come in. And it's the technology to be able to deliver those services to the right students at the right time. Our graduation rates, and we've got to, um, I'm waiting actually for the final data for us to update this, because this is obviously four and five years out. But you can see, again, for your graduation rates, we were at about 24% back in 2011. Uh, and 17, we are just at 50%. When you're measuring this in four-year increments, that is that is just huge. That is such a, a steep improvement in a very short amount of time. And I think we're going to be up above 55% uh, for the next class as we measure that out. Um, so that is going to be absolutely critical for us. Um, and that is our, our funding is based on this. All right, so case management transformation. So here's, here's summing it all up. This is what our students look like as they're coming through the door, a little uh, wet behind the ears, a little uh, a little uh, raggedy. And of course, then the outcome is, that's what we want to achieve is the, the graduation there. Okay, so with that q and I'm going to actually turn off the slideshow so I can see you all. And I'm going to get Brian back on here, who hopefully has done a great job of trying to record all those questions that I didn't hit. And let's do a deep dive into that. And so we've had a bunch of questions just coming through the chat to, uh, today and we've been recording them and there might be some questions that are still coming uh, through the chat and we will touch on those as we get to them. But Joe, you've talked a lot about relationship building being more challenging. Um, or relationship building can be challenging. So one of the questions that we got is this person asked, they're implementing a first year advising this spring. Is relationship building more challenging when students start off with a first year advisor and then have to transition to, let's say, a college advisor? Um, you know, I, I think it can be, but it doesn't have to be um, because that's actually very similar to our model. Students are under my umbrella for the first two years, uh, generally speaking, and then they, we hand them off to their college. So in, in a lot of ways, it it helps me define and work with our students uh, on terms of what advising is. So, you know, think about as a traditional age student, most students coming out of high school think of us as high school counselors. And that's that's generally not usually a, a, uh, a compliment, <laughs> right? High school counselors are huge caseloads, usually the ones that call the student in when they're in trouble. So, you know, you, you wonder why it's so hard to get a student to come in when they're on probation if they think of you as a high school counselor and what's going to happen when you get uh, you know, a call from your counselor, you're expecting to, you know, you're not doing well type of conversation, not we want to help you do this, right? And so for us, that actually helped us leverage an institutional change to this model because we set the bar with our freshmen of what to expect. We told our freshmen at orientation, this is a model we're going to use. And if all you're asked is what courses I should take based on this major, then you stop your advisor right then and there. And you say, I want to talk about my passions and interests and where I want to go. And boy, you know what? When they were handed off to their college and the colleges started to just do the course scheduling and the students have had two years of appreciative relationship building, they stopped them in their tracks and said, no, I want to have these conversations. That's how we got institutional change to move here at FAU. It was student driven. So absolutely critical. Thank you, Joe. Another question that we got when you were talking about uh, intrusive advising, this person has starting this fall semester on August 24th. How many weeks before uh, the semester do you like start reaching out to students? Or like you mentioned Labor Days, like let's all get our advising done. And so when like do you start reaching out to students who may not be coming through like orientation or sending that message to returning students? Yeah, so all right, so let me let me back up. So let's limit this right now to uh, incoming students, not continuing students. Okay, so incoming students, because we use a flipped orientation model. And what I mean by that is orientation for us is about relationship building. It's not about the business of attending college. The business of attending college needs to be done before they come to orientation. And that's critical. When we made that shift, 
our yield, because students were still shopping for their institution at the when they came to orientation. And so if your experience at orientation was having to wait in line to see an advisor for five minutes to take a course that you weren't excited about at a time you hated because it was the only thing left, are they going to come if they're comparing you against another school and they got a better schedule, right? That's going to drive this. And so we shifted to requiring advising and course registration before they come to orientation so that orientation can be about relationship building. So throughout the entire orientation experience, and that was both in-person and virtual, they were told that Labor Day is when that is going to start. And so for us, that also helped the definition. There's no classes that have been scheduled yet for by Labor Day. That's two weeks into the semester. So literally when you meet with them, it's a conversation about advising. It's not course scheduling. Mm -hmm. And so that really helped us to, to define that. For current students who don't have an advising hold, they can go in and register for courses anytime they want, but there's a need there. One of the things that we're gonna pilot this year because the numbers are so large right now for us, we have a record class coming in, record retention, is we've created a Canvas course that a student can take that puts together all in one location resources to do advising. And then they can request not an advising appointment, but a consultation. They literally submit a quiz to their assigned advisor and that quiz are the courses they plan to take for the fall. And then we can at that point say, you know what, these are fine, you're good to go. Or you know what, we need to talk about this, take this course instead of this course. Or you know what, you've got three different majors on here we're not going to respond. We're not going to say yay or nay on any of this stuff. We're going to require you come in and see us. Mm -hmm. And so we maintain that that control for them as well. And so we look at those two populations a little differently in terms of our marketing. New students coming in versus continuing students. I appreciate that, Joe. And I do know that it's four o'clock here on the East Coast time. We have a few more questions and we are going to continue if you still have some time and we will record the answers and we'll have it uploaded in the recording when the recording becomes available sometime later this week. And we will send notifications of that being posted to yeah, our I'm, I'm happy to stay and, and do questions. So I saw a quick one about uh, spring. Uh, MLK is our, our Labor Day, MLK Day. Uh, Martin Luther King is our equivalent to the appointment starting in the spring. Perfect. Great, great eye there, Joe, to catch that and to add that piece of information you talked a little bit about um like the like i know that with university advising services you have the ebbs and flows of times where you have walk-in appointments and students are walking in to meet with an advisor and times where it's more appointment based how do you transition from that appointment based to that walk-in model and then back so so absolutely critical in terms of the structure because if you're going to do relationship building you can do case management you have to build in your structure the ability to handle the emergencies Right, a student that walks in that is in crisis at that point in time. Uh, and so um, every single day we rotate this because this would be a lot to ask for a single advisor. We rotate this. Uh, so each we have somebody who is on call each day. They have no students on their pre uh, advising appointments. And their job is to handle any crises that come in, answer emails that are front lobby, uh, you know, that are advising questions that our front lobby can't handle. Uh, and uh, and phone calls are transferred to them. On the peak periods, we actually pull two of, uh, advisors off and we'll have two people, uh, one doing phone calls, for example, one doing emails. Uh, and so that is absolutely critical because you've got to have the flexibility to respond to the emergencies while you're also doing this. If it's an emergency, the student's not going to care too much whether they see their, their assigned advisor or not. It's, I need an answer right now. And so that's that's what we deal with. And then if it turns into a larger conversation, the student can say, okay, why don't you, we can refer the student, why don't you have this conversation with, with Michelle? Uh, this is not critical right now. We can change your major in a week. <laughs> let's, let's get you connected with the folks that know you best and can have a, a good in-depth conversation with you as, as an example. I appreciate that, Joe. And you were talking, when you were talking earlier about uh, Labor Day and MLK Day being like those, the same mark points for each, the fall and spring semester, uh, talking about reaching out to students. How do you reach out to uh, students? How do you have your advisors reach out to them? Do they do mass emails, texting, calling? What does that communication strategy look like from advisor to a student? Sure. So we've put together a communication plan for every group of students. And actually, we just finished it up for this year. 
And so, for example, we have uh, a calendar and there are some emails that come from me from the institution, right? So the associate dean is saying, hey, don't forget that Labor Day is when you should start your advising. Well, so those are coming institutional. Most of our emails will come from the advisor to whom they're assigned. We want to build that relationship and it helps increase the open rates. If it's coming from Michelle, and I know Michelle is my advisor, well, odds are I'm gonna open that up. And so we have a calendar of, of all the emails and the, the sample emails are already written. So the advisor can put in their own information, but we've got the core that is across the board. Everybody's the same. At, towards the end of the semester, we start to kick in our texting campaign. So let's say, for example, now uh, I'm Michelle, I've got 350 students, and I've got 50 students that have not come in to see me or anybody else. So now we're going to do a texting campaign with them. Hey, are you coming back? What's going on? How can I help? That maybe gets narrowed, that gets narrowed down to 20. Then we shift into a calling campaign. Okay, you know what? We're coming out of Thanksgiving. We still haven't heard from you. What's going on? And so what case management does for us is we literally lose no students behind the, between the cracks. At the end of the semester, it is our expectation that our advisors can say, here are the five students that we have emailed, we have texted, we have called, and still haven't told us whether they're coming back or not. They're now obviously on our, uh, our at risk that we're probably, they're probably not coming back. And we can start to calculate our retention race based on, on that, uh, that information. So, so it leverages up and that campaign is gonna be different for our foster youth. It's gonna be different for our, our deciding students. It's gonna be different for the pre-law. So every one of those special populations has a communication plan that fits on top of the general ones to make sure that we're not bombarding them with six different uh, emails from my office by themselves. Mm -hmm. The other thing we're gonna try this year is we're gonna have the same subject title so that students can search to find us. So all of our emails are gonna start with UAS advising and then it's gonna be dash whatever it is, registration opens, dash whatever, right? And so a student could go into their account and if they do a search based on UAS advising, those emails will rise to the top because they were just overwhelmed and we were trying to figure out a way to help them organize that. So that's going to be something we're going to try this year as well. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. I have a just a few more questions here. So you taught, you showed us that one slide with the different student populations and what time of the semester that they're coming in for academic advising appointments. You use the example athletics as being like weeks eight and nine being the most uh, appropriate for them based on their schedule and getting them in and tar targeting them for those weeks. How do you manage students that may not fall into categories like athletics or the Kelly Stroll uh, scholarship recipients that, like for me, I, I was a, right, uh, I wanna say a regular, air quotes, regular student. I wasn't in any scholarship program or anything. Like how do you navigate students like that so you don't have like a bottleneck come that end of the semester and you shared a little bit of it here but just wanted to ask that question sure. because someone put it in the chat earlier so, so keep in mind that even though those are targeted outreaches to those special populations any student can schedule an appointment during those times we don't restrict it just for student athletes number one right and so so brian as a, as a, a regular normal student <laughs> um, air quotes Right, you would be getting these messages from from me and your assigned advisor for the full semester. And so, if if there's an appointment that's available and you schedule it, absolutely fine. Uh, the reason we identified those groups was because we had other offices had leverage on those students to force them or to encourage them or to whatever you, word you want to use to schedule that. And remember, eighty percent is a sweet spot. So if I can get eighty percent of a group to use those appointments then I'm using those appointments early so that I have the capacity for all the procrastinators in, in November. So if you are if you ghost me until November and I've done a good job of filling all my appointments up to that, I have a much better shot of being able to get you in in November than if all of those populations, if all of our student athletes wait until November, then I'm in real trouble, right? And so we actually have, been, we've filled all of our appointments from day one on Labor Day this year and we're struggling to keep up. Uh, but that's a good problem to have now. It's a really bad problem to have in December. Absolutely. Uh, Joe, you talked a lot about the success network that you've been instrumental in setting up at FAU and bringing financial aid consultants in the Career Center, University Advising Services, and 
structuring that. I know that there is a lot of student sensitive information such as FERPA or HIPAA forms that might be in one office and not another. How do you navigate working with those different departments on campus with forms such as uh, FERPA or HIPAA uh, concerns? HIP is an easy one. We don't deal with that at all. If if it's if they're working with our disability services office or CAPS, which is the uh, you know mental health counseling and those types of things, there's we can make referrals, but they're not communicating back to us. Did the student follow through or what they're doing? That's that's obviously all all protected. So we we don't have to worry about that at all. On the on the uh, FERPA side of things, all of these office has a have a right under FERPA to know that information. Now, we don't share individual conversations with students in the appointments, but as a retention officer under FERPA, now your institution may define this differently, but from a legal perspective, I have every right to know which students are on their uh, satisfactory academic appeal, their SAP appeal process, because that is a retention issue. And I, my job is to reach out to try to retain these students. So there is nothing legally that would stop me from knowing that information. Now, your institution may feel differently about that, but from a legal perspective, I can share all of those types of information with any of those offices because that is their job. Um, so so there's that's no problem there. Now, we don't share advising notes with the Career Center. Career Center doesn't share their advising notes, but they will tell me when a student shows up over there or not and, and vice versa. So we actually help um, direct those students to those areas and we know whether they win or not, even though we don't know what that conversation occurred. I appreciate that. Just two more questions. Like I said, they, they're all coming in. A lot of folks <laughs> have a lot of questions for you because you're just a wealth of knowledge. Joe, I know University Advising Services works primar primarily with incoming students, but I also know I have a friend over there, Amber Mandek, who works uh, with transfer students coming into the institution. Can you speak to how your office navigates working with transfer students? So when we did our analysis, one of the things that we discovered was that new transfer students who were coming in the institution, typically they would be handed off to their college advisors right, right from the very beginning. However, the college advising offices were struggling with the demand because unfortunately, all the things that we do with, with new students, with our first time in college FPIC students, uh, is condensed for transfer students. We don't nearly have as long of a drawn out onboarding process, which means that transfer students tend to hit at the very end of the semester because they're waiting for final grades at their other institution to send that and to do all that. Now, they, they're not, they don't have to do that, but that's what's up here in their head. And so they, they tend to group uh, and the demand hits very late in the semester. So the colleges were really struggling with getting these students onboarded and, and registered for courses before classes started, in this case, let's say in January, right? And so we have a whole new initiative now where we have some dedicated advisors under my umbrella that literally just help the students onboard for the very first semester to get them scheduled in their courses. And then the handoff from that point forward is with their colleges, but we help them get their courses registered uh, and take that load off the advising offices. So that has really helped with our yield for transfer uh, and that make sure that they're in the right courses from day one and they're not doing that on their own because they haven't been able uh, to meet with a, a college advising uh, department yet. Perfect, Joe. And then my last question for you, you know, about academic advisors, they see students that are going through a lot of different things, right? And students may not know where to turn and sometimes turning to their academic advisor is the first person that they go to is that resource hub. And so how do you work with your staff to help them teach students of what departments they can go to for specific types of supports? So because we work with first and second year students, and in particular first year students and new transfers, it is absolutely critical that my entire office knows everything that's going on on campus. We are generalists. And so part of our advising structure is that every advisor is a liaison to every single campus office and college on campus. And so it is that liaison's responsibility to periodically reach out to, let's say the Career Center and say, hey, share with me your dates, share with me what's going on. We will make sure the advising staff knows that. We know when the career uh, you know, interview days are coming. Uh, we know what's happening in each of the colleges and we share our information back with them. 
So that's critical. We invite the key offices in to do trainings with our staff. We have staff meetings every other Friday. And so financial aid literally just came in. If, if, if most of you don't realize this yet, uh, financial aid is completely changing. And this is a federal thing. Uh, estimated family contribution, EFC. If you speak a little bit of financial aid, hola como estas, right? ESC is going away. It's going to be a brand new calculation by the feds. And so we've got to know the baseline. We're not going to do financial aid advising. No way, no how. But we've got to be able to speak the language to make those referrals. So, so that is critical. So bringing those offices in. We just did one with admissions. We, we're doing one with financial aid. International is a huge one with, with understanding when we see a, a visa type. What does that mean? There are some visa types that have to be full time. Well, if we're advising students and we see that and the student says, I want to be part time because I need to work. And I see a visa type on there that says, oh, no, that's a, that's a trouble. You're going to get kicked out of the country if you're not full time. We can catch that and have that conversation. So the cross training is absolutely critical uh, as a part of that. And as liaisons, then we know what's going on and what the critical parts are. Liaison to, to the veterans office. That's another one that have a lot of deadlines and rules and policies that you've got to know about as an advisor. So, so that's another good example there is with our, our veterans. Awesome, Joe. Thank you. And I did see that Doug dropped the question in the chat just recently. It's, will your office meet with prospective students? I know that orientation, your academic advisors are on staff and they're meeting with students going through orientation, but I'm wondering if you have anything that you'd like to expand upon that last question there. That's a tough one. Um, we are so packed right now that the quick answer is no. However, there are certain populations that uh, we've been told are a priority. So, for example, uh, our, um, and I, I can never remember them, the presidential um, award winners, the uh, merit scholars, presidential merit scholars, whatever that national one mm -hmm. that we're, you know, we're trying to recruit. So if we have prospective students that are in that category, yes, we will make that available. If it's potentially an honors student, we will do that. Um, we've made the offer for athletics. They actually don't engage us very much with that. Um, they're, they're usually not focused on the academics when they're recruiting, but the offer's on the table. Um, but can we meet with all of them? Uh, no, but the relationship with your admissions office is critical. So your admissions folks really become your gatekeepers. Uh, and I trust them. If I get a message from our admissions folks and say, we really need you to talk with this student, I'm not going to question why. We'll go ahead and reach out and, and try to do that. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. And I know more questions keep coming, but for the sake of time, we're going to move on. And again, Joe, I can't say thank you enough for doing this. Jenny, I'm going to pass it over to you for any uh, closing thoughts. Brian, before we do that, I just dropped my email back in the chat. Um, I would be happy if folks want to email me directly. I'd be happy to, to continue that conversation again, uh, you know, with anything we've shared here with, with the foster youth and homeless populations, with, with the flip orientation. Um, you know, actually, one of, one of my things that I love to do is, is something I call R&D. And for most folks, that's um, research and development. For me, it's rip off and duplicate. And so I am a full, full believer of R&D. Of course, we're in higher ed, so you need a site, right? You got to cite your sources. But other than mm -hmm. that, I want you to take this information and run with it on what works for your populations at your institutions. And I would be happy to work with you to try to figure out what are the key questions you should be asking to make it work. So with that, Joe, Jenny, thank you. Yeah, Joe, thank you for your generosity uh, in sharing your, your wisdom and these tools that you have used so effectively at FAU. And, uh, and thank you for offering your email address. So uh, Joe is sincere in offering this. So I encourage you if you'd like to uh, have a conversation with Joe to please follow up with him. So thank you all. We appreciate it. And Brian, special thanks to you for coordinating our webinar series. This was an excellent way to kick off our fall webinar series and looking forward to the next one. So have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everybody. I'm also going to be in a cottage. I may go into Orlando yeah. here in October. Yep.